you for coming along to, um, to this is Queering Poetry, um, which is so far been the first panel that we've managed to do is the festival that is going ahead, which is fantastic. So thank you for being here and making it all worthwhile. Uh, so yeah, as Paul said, my name is Tom Seddon. I'm an events producer for Writing Crowd, which is an LGBTQ uh, writers network, uh, based in Nottingham, but trying to spread UK wide, obviously. Um, I am a poet myself, so I think I've got a limited amount of poetry to lead this panel. I've published two collections today, uh, the first one called The Smart Mouth Victim, and the second one called Death is Awful for the Living. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our panellists, because that is enough about me, I think. I'll start on this side. Um, so this is Gregory Woods, and he is the author of Articulate Flesh, Male Homoeroticism and Modern Poetry, A History of Gay Literature, and Home in Turn, How Gay Culture Liberated the Modern World, all from Yale University Press. His poetry includes We Have the Melon, May I Say Nothing, The District Commissioner's Dreams, Quid Nunk, and An Ordinary Dog, all from, is it? Carcanet. Car Carcanet, okay. <laughs> Carcanet Press. In 1995, Gay Times called him the foremost gay poet working in Britain today, and in 1998, he became the first professor of gay and lesbian studies in the UK at Nottingham Trent University, uh, where he's still Professor Emeritus. Gregory Woods. <laughs> If I could also ask you to uh, read some of your work. Read now. a poem, yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll just read um, a sonnet. I suppose it's appropriate that it's the first poem we're hearing. It, it's an invocation to the muses, and um, I've always thought of the, the muses as a kind of uh, gang of, of lesbian avengers. <laughs> um, and, and this was the, the first poem in my last uh, collection, uh, An Ordinary Dog. Come, hungry muses, sink your fangs into the rancid meat of things. Give us another of those songs that fizz the spittle on your tongues. Descend on us in raucous gangs, tattooed and sporting nipple rings. Evacuate those tarry lungs and goad us with your humour's prongs. Conciliate your hunger pangs with scraps of life the random slings and arrows felt by human throngs. Forgather where the tyrant hangs and harry anyone who brings to human rights inhuman wrongs. Thank you. Round of applause, please. <laughs> uh, next to my left, we have uh, Rich Goodson. So, which is a poet, writer, teacher, workshop leader, and artist, so busy enough, as you can imagine, who's taught English to refugees and migrants in Nottingham for the last 22 years. As a doctorate in creative writing from Nottingham Trent, uh, for which he wrote poems which explored masculinity and the male body. Rich's pamphlet, Mr. Universe, was published by Eyewear Books in 2017 and was selected by the Poetry Book Society as their autumn pamphlet choice. It was described by Todd Swift as an LGBT classic. Um, he also performs his poems as part of a free jazz trio, which released a double album last year on Mutiant Records. And he lives in Sherwood with his husband and a Dalmatian dog called Polka. Okay. <laughs> Introduce yourself with some of your work, please, Rich. Thank you. Um, I had a bit of a dilemma as to whether I should read a, a queer poem or a not-so-queer poem. What do you fancy? <laughs> well, I'll read the queer one. But Excellent. <laughs> I think I'm probably a bit blind to the, how queer my poem, poems are. <laughs> Maybe the non-queer poem is quite queer. Maybe we can touch on it. Um, so this is um, a kind of deliberate mistranslation of one of Michelangelo's sonnets. Um, it's actually quite far from the original, but it does... Um, use the last few lines. In the original sonnet, uh, Michelangelo says something about being the prisoner of an armed cavalier, which um, the word cavalier was playing on the word um, cavalieri, which was the surname of this um, aristocrat who he was very much in love with, really, for many, many years. So I return to that word at the end. A fog as intense as this ain't going to lift as easily as a street slut lifts off his vest. Why bother with the fog bell? It's set in. My weather. The blankness with which I'm dressed. 
I have no tick, no tempo. Even the thought of the bull of death stampeding towards me bores me. When did the clock wash its hands of my torso? Each minute ignores me or gores me. <coughs> Yet above this fog the golden sun still ticks and warms, warms and moves. Will my cowboy ever slide inside me where what's so tender wars with what's so sore? The sun warms and moves, moves and molests. Even if the fog lifts, I'll be so nude, so low, so lassoed behind my rider on a horse. First to my right, we have Tony Chalice. So Tony has been active in the LGBT movement since the 70s, even taking part in the London Pride March in 1973. He has been writing in his own words for a very long time now, <laughs> and is currently the chair of Nottingham Poetry Society. Thanks. <laughs> well, yesterday, um, Tom and I were both on a workshop where we were led into writing from inside other people's minds, which is always good to do and always interesting. But um, it made me think about the way one of the big desires is for us to be as close as possible to others. Um, and sometimes this can be quite dangerous, it can have backlashes. But uh, thinking about what happened in that workshop, I then wrote something when I went home from it. So this is very fresh, dangerously new, but my young <laughs> friends always say, do the new one. So, um, <clears throat> so I've titled it Hands On. Sweep the hands up, around and down, the masseur's first action, up beside the spine, around the shoulders, and down at the side, smoothing this light coffee torso. India, Ireland, Portugal, England, this world-blooded man of now, creation of empire's impulses. Feel his tension easing as the hands prevail. Hear the gasp that registers the weight of touch. Know the desire to go beneath the skin and breathe with him the mysteries within. The added bonus of the debut. <laughs> Then we have Pippa Hennessy, um, who is a publisher living and working in Nottingham. She's spent the last few years trying to understand quantum theory through poetry, although this may have turned out to be the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it did. Um, I'm just going to read a poem that's about my daughter, who was a sign male at birth. So, slightly queer. Um, it's called The Observer Effect. I saw my daughter yesterday, tangled hair red from her shoulders to the base of her spine, blonde rooted. When she was a boy, it was white. I delivered him late with long nails. I slipped when cutting them, licked a speck of blood. My tears sprinkled his fuzzed head. Slow to start, I saw her grow as fast as I could measure his height, stopping only when she needed to bend to kiss my forehead. For her fourth birthday, she asked us for a Barbie doll. His dad and I laughed, said, don't believe everything adverts sell you. Boys' playground games were alien to her, standing alone at the edge. She didn't like colouring. Teachers told him it's a treat for the good boys and girls. They didn't know she's colour blind, didn't care. Not all children like colouring, I told him. It's okay. When Spider-Man fought for his life, she wept on my lap, anxious about the tears in his new finely sewn costume. I see my daughter now, peeking out from behind my son's eyes. I see my daughter, and I don't know what equation describes her. So, on to the lead discussion aspect. Um, it will be, I can assure you, not in the slightest bit strict. I invite all of you to pipe <laughs> up at any moment that you would like to. Um, but I would just like to open up with the first question. What came first, discovering poetry or discovering that you were LGBTQ? <laughs> well, poetry goes back a long way, doesn't it? Because you get told nursery tales. You get, you're lying in bed in the cold at age four. And, and, 
and somebody's telling you nursery tales. So you encounter poetry very early. Um, you also encounter being gay a long time before you have the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I knew in primary school um, that I fancied some of the lodges we had were young men, and I fancied some of the other boys in primary school, but I never accepted the idea that I might be, partly because I grew up, as others here may have done, in a very homophobic environment, uh, in a, um, with my mother converted to strict of Catholicism, and it was an abomination. So you felt, I can't be an abomination, surely. So you denied it. So you knew and denied uh, at the same time, and you knew poetry. So I don't know how to answer the question. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose it could be quite fully loaded us, but I didn't even take nursery rhymes into consideration. So you yeah. pulled the rug out from beneath me. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, any thoughts? Um, <laughs> it just reminds me about what you said about um, having Catholic parents. My parents were from a very um, Methodist background, and I think that had a, and also a very working class background, I have to say. So there are no books in my house whatsoever. Um, and the only, my first awareness of poetry was probably, or maybe nursery rhymes, as you were saying, but probably Rupert Bear manuals. <laughs> and possibly when I was staying on, at my grandma's house, a Methodist hymn book. And that, that was probably my first awareness of poetry. And I was absolutely <coughs> fascinated by that Rupert Bear manual and that hymn book. And I probably didn't read any proper poetry till I was 10 or 11. Mm. Um, well, your introduction was quite camp, though. I mean, Rupert Bear and... <laughs> 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 yeah, he did have very good trousers, didn't he? Um, <laughs> I've not thought of that before. Um, as, as far as having a, a gay awareness, I mean, looking back, I was a very gay child. I was making perfume in the back garden and nicking my mum and mum's items of clothing to try on, even though I didn't kind of pursue that. But I suppose straight kids do that as well, perhaps. And I didn't come out until I was 26, so quite late. Um, and I do have a kind of almost slightly ambivalent or detached attitude to my gay stroke queer identity. I almost think that um, my identity as a poet is more important to me. Mm. It goes back further um, and it possibly means more to me, I don't know. Maybe I can explore that right here and now, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it is a very open show and mm. circle. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That's really interesting. From this side, I suppose, from <laughs> the book ends of this conversation. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely sure which came first. I think I didn't come out as gay as such. I realised I was gradually when I was about 30 which was a bit sort of slow of me, it's been obvious ever since I was a teenager. Um, and I hadn't really been into poetry at all when I was younger. Not, didn't like it, didn't read it. Um, it was only maybe seven or eight years ago that I actually started taking it seriously and realising that maybe poetry was something I wanted to do. But I guess it's different being a poet in that you kind of decide that you're going to write poetry, whereas being gay is just something you are. Well, I'm yeah. not quite sure. I think it was, um, <laughs> I think <laughs> I just instinctively wanted to write poetry from a young age just as much as I instinctively wanted to chase boys. So. Yeah. <laughs> 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 might contest you on that slightly from my, from my experience. Yeah, no, but um, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. They are just kind of, I suppose they are things that can just come upon you later at, at not mm -hmm. a normal developmental stage as it's put. So. Um, Tom, Tom gave us some notice of, of <laughs> the questions he was going to ask us today. And, and this was the one that completely stumped me. <laughs> I, 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 don't really have any kind of answer to it. Um, uh, I mean, I assume that I was, uh, I assume I've always been gay. I don't think I've ever been anything else. Um, I associate 
reading poetry with reading, um, and perhaps with nursery rhymes and with, with, with hearing, hearing things being read, hearing human voices. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of any moment. There must have been a moment when I first wrote a poem, but that would probably have been at school where it would have been rubbish anyway, but uh, uh, I mean, it would have been something suggested by the teacher, you know, <laughs> not, not um, uh, from within. Um, so I, I, I don't really have a start point. I just assume that I, I've always been gay and I've always been a poet, and, and uh, probably both of them are equally an abomination. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> though I'm, I think I'm more used to being gay than to being a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, that leads on quite nicely to it. Can you think of anything that did draw you towards poetry or, or becoming a poet? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just, I mean, from, from my point of view, it's just, just uh, uh, um, being able to do certain things. Mm. And, and I, pe people ask me now, why, why do you write poems that rhyme? Um, and why do you use meter as if it was like uh, running a steam engine or something. Um, and my only answer to that is, well, I can. And I enjoy doing it. Um, I mean, I also do unrhymed ones and, and so on. But um, So I, I suppose I, I just think that, you know, I, I, I became good at English mm. because I was good with language. And I suppose it just developed out of that. Again, I can't think of a start point. That it's something to do with with literacy and with realizing that I was very good at, at, at English, better than other kids in class, and then wanting to sort of see, well, what can I do with this, you know, and, and enjoying writing little stories and, and enjoying getting the highest marks in the spelling <laughs> test and, and things like this, whereas that was not happening with my my mathematics or whatever, you know, any of my other subjects. So, so it just came, I think, I think it's developed out of enjoying being good at something. Mm. And that's also why I write certain kinds of poems, mm. I think. I think it, it's funny you should say that, actually, it's similar for me. My, my brother got numbers and I got letters and words, which is why he makes football players money and I'm skin tall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is, I suppose it is quite a difficult question, but it is why I wanted to throw it out there, just to get people to think if they could pinpoint it, because really it's something that, as you go along and start to define yourself as a poet, which for some is quite an uncomfortable label, others would rather just say, oh, I just enjoy writing poetry, um, to actually kind of think, was there a spark moment of going, yes, I'm absolutely going to do this? I'm just curious. <laughs> it certainly was for me. Um, mm. I was determined to be a novelist, still got the plot of the novel in my head, I wrote half of it, um, and I went and did a creative writing degree at Nottingham Uni, um, and sort of going into it as someone hating poetry, I did hate poetry, actually hated it, um, I couldn't see the point of it, didn't understand it at all, only I had to do a poetry class in the second year, and once I started writing it, I thought, ah, Actually, yeah, I, I started to get it, started to understand it. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was definitely a moment for me, mm. probably around about the second one of the poetry sessions. Yeah, I, th I think when I studied poetry at university, that's, um, it was the smallest group of the whole course, so that kind of told me something. And, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the first things that was said in the uh, first um, actual lesson that I went to was um, I'm just telling you now that there is no money left in poetry and I thought oh, that's great isn't it <laughs> it really, really set me up to continue with this passion so I'm really glad that you had such a positive experience in comparison with it yeah they didn't tell me about the money <laughs> the money doesn't matter you do it for love and fame but were you expecting that <laughs> No, just, you know, the adoration of my parents. Um, 
I'm waiting for either to come in and check any day now. <laughs> yeah, the late Peter Redgrave I was in a workshop with once, and he, he said, you're really lucky with poetry if you get your postage back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, um, I think I was 40 before I really began writing poetry, because I had this feeling I'd, I'd taught it in schools and I'd studied it, but I felt I couldn't do this. I, I enjoyed writing, and I enjoyed writing stories, uh, which was the main thing I did, and I fancied myself as a novelist, as people did. Uh, but um, then I decided to go on this course, which was aimed at teachers, down at a place called Sheepwash in Devon, an interesting place where I often run courses, and it's all thin wooden floors, and if you're gossiping about some of them downstairs at one end, beware, you can be heard, even if you're whispering <laughs> upstairs in the bar. <laughs> no. uh, so it's a very good place for writers to get material. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I started writing there. There's this guy, Wes McGee, I believe, and he, he said that he liked what I was writing, and he said, but you must, you must pay attention to your audience and think of your audience, mm. because you've got four images in the first line here, and I thought, oh, it's less clotted. Uh, I've always had that as something that I need to remember, less clotted. Um, but uh, yeah, I gradually got to enjoy doing it more and more. Um, I still need a bit of a jump start sometimes uh, because there are so many other things, and I'm always going to be organising other events that I need poetry and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I need to push myself, and I'm 73 now. If I don't push myself now, when will I? Um, so um, yeah, I need to find more time to write. And a week like this inspires you, as it has done yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, well, you were told to be selfish. Yes, yes, <laughs> but he the yesterday workshop. said, be selfish. Be selfish yes. as a writer. <laughs> uh, you've got to prioritise time, then. you've got to prioritise yourself, you've got to say, never mind all these people, all these organisations, all these uh, needs, and the terrible state the world is in, be selfish and write something. Absolutely. Any final thoughts on that? <laughs> um, made me, well, you were talking about parents, it made me think about uh, my parents, um, <coughs> as I mentioned, my background is quite working class and there were no books and my mum and dad were not encouraged to look at books or buy books or, or even try hard at school to be honest. Um, they were encouraged to be mechanics and so forth. Mm. Um, but my mum especially pushed me to read before I went to school because she wanted me to be different. Mm. Um, to kind of make up for what she didn't have, kind of thing. So I feel like I'm in therapy. Um, <laughs> you are. <laughs> this is an intervention <laughs> that I've staged. But I suppose I became really fascinated with how words sound through that experience of learning to read with my mum before school. Mm. And from a very early age, probably around five and six, I became aware that we pronounced words in a different way to the, to the way they were spelt. They looked different and spellings were incongruous and eccentric. Mm. And I was fascinated by this, this difference. I suppose that led me to being interested in the way poetry is performed and looks different on the page in this weird tension between how it, the page and the voice. Mm. Um, I suppose I wanted to be a poet from those very early years, uh, and I got praise for it, and mm. you mentioned this. And when you're little and you get praise, you want to do it again, because you want more praise. Um, but then I started, as I got into puberty, I started writing poems which nobody understood, <laughs> which kind of put a spanner in the works. And eventually I started writing stories which people did understand. And so I kind of got sidetracked. Mm. And then I did an MA in fiction and travel writing. And I kind of denied being a poet, I think. Um, but then came out as a poet later. <laughs> <laughs> I realised that was truly what I was. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, it's great. <laughs> Just Amused by, I came out as a poet. So <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you're a poet. Do your parents know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it is a serious point. I think there is a, a, 
I mean, we're in a deeply uh, anti-intellectual culture in this country, but we're also in a, a, a very strongly anti-poetic culture. Mm. It's a very kind of uh, uh, pragmatic, uh, literalist culture, mm. uh, um, supposedly very logical and so on. And actually, the, uh, from my point of view, there's a great deal of shame attached to being a poet. Uh, um, <laughs> but it, it's... Uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not even very comfortable with saying I am a poet. Mm. I, 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 that's not how I earned my living. Um, so, uh, I, th I, I mean, I think this is, it, it is a point worth kind of exploring in the context of queerness as well, mm. this, this, this question of taking on this, this uh, uh, identity or this, this activity that is widely disapproved of. Mm. or widely misunderstood at least. There's a lot of people who would sooner describe themselves as a spoken word artist, mm -hmm. even though what they are doing is in essence poetry, which is quite interesting. I mean, because you could say instead I'm a performance poet, mm -hmm. but yeah. I guess it is about how people identify with their work just as much as it is how they identify as an individual. Um, There's so also perhaps a, a generational difference there as, uh, as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. More younger people are, are willing to, perform, uh, to identify as spoken word poets, I mm. think. I mean, I, I didn't even have even heard of the term until no. I was in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, well, it's a recent term, isn't mm. it, I think. Okay. Um, well, I, I think um, we sort of touched on this a little bit in what was uh, being said earlier. I mean, you said that you started writing poems that nobody understood, and I... Um, wondered, <laughs> um, do you feel that there's any way that your sexuality and gender identity have shaped your work when you have been kind of writing and figuring things out as a queer poet or was that kind of not part of it or how did the two things feed into each other as it were because for, my, for myself what I could relate to that is whilst I was kind of figuring things out as a teenager I wrote a lot of terrible poems that were really just a series of questions um, that would never see the light of day and I would never show them to anyone but mm. they were very important at the time and what it taught me as I continued to write poetry was that I always wanted it to be representative of things that were weird and queer because that's what I was mm. so it's continued to feed into my work throughout you know my whole my lifespan so far as a poet and I just wondered if anyone else had any similar experiences with it or were you just right to try and get that non-existent money? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, as a, I suppose it depends what part of your life we're talking about. I mean, certainly in the early part of my life, I, when I wasn't particularly identified as, as queer, I wrote lots of very confusing and confused poetry because I was trying to work out that queerness, mm. even though I didn't realise that at the time. And I felt a huge amount of shame, actually, and fear, which has completely shaped who I am. Um, I mean, I grew up in the 80s. I was a teenager in the 80s. And my experience of that is that I was starting to realise I was gay. And I thought that I would die from one week to the next from something horrible, AIDS. I thought I would die a horrible, shameful death. I wouldn't see the year out. And I felt like that for 10, 15 years, from the early teenage years. And that's completely shaped my life. Yeah. And that completely shaped the kind of confused poetry I was writing. And I think it was many years later, in fact, probably when I started my doctorate, when I kind of more consciously took hold of my queerness and tried to make it into something that I owned and something more positive mm. that I definitely wanted and still want to write out that shame mm. and get rid of it or at least I don't know offer it to the world as my experience and let the people do what they want with it but, but that's very important work to do I, I mean mm. in my opinion argue against it but I think that having that voice which is um, relatable 
um, which kind of touches on my next question, so I won't go too much into it, but having that voice that is relatable, I think is so important for, um, you know, audiences that need it, even if they are quite small, and, you know, the fact that they're small and marginalised makes it all the more powerful to give them that content, I suppose. Mm. I suppose, sorry, I just think about gender identity as well. Um, I now deliberately and consciously write poems because of my interest in life, but mm. I, I'm exploring masculinity as well, and I'm kind of doing that from the point of view of a man who kind of takes on some of the tropes of masculinity but rejects a lot of them. But is generally happy to be a man, but very aware that as a gay man, I'm kind of inside that identity, but also outside that identity. Mm. So I'm kind of got one step in it and one step out of it, which is a very creative place to be in. Mm. So it's, that queerness is pretty essential to what I do as a poet. So I any bells. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it makes sense to separate them out. You see what I mean? So, I, when I write poems, I don't deliberately set out to write queer poems, but because I'm gay and that's my perspective, mm. that's kind of how the poems come out. Yeah, um, yeah. And I have to admit to putting a few things in poems to try and shock people. Mm. You know, people who don't know I'm gay, if I talk about my wife, that kind of upsets them, which is quite funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll say something more. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I sometimes think a, a lot of the poems that I write, and even the stories that I write, aren't evidently gay, and, and write about other things. And I was uh, down elsewhere in the country, in Gloucestershire, on the weekend, and I was... Uh, uh, there was an audience there which included people who were both uh, gay and straight. But uh, the focus I took was, I've always had quite a, a, a considerable environmental interest in, uh, in things generally. And <coughs> the workshop focused largely on trees of all things. So maybe you can think that funny, I don't know. But that was my <laughs> intention. <laughs> uh, and there's been a lot of recent publication, recent interest and thought about the sort of nature and interconnectedness of trees and the community of them. But in a way, this could be a way of talking about um, other communities and communities amongst uh, queer people as well. But um, I should say 80% of what I write you would have to look closely to see the gay element, and yet uh, probably the way in which I approach subjects, the way in which you know, the slant that I have is affected by my sexuality. Mm. I sometimes think I don't write enough about <coughs> um, about actually actual gay experience uh, and actually the, the, the emotions between men. Um, I think one thing that may hold me back a little is that within the 80s, I did read lots of American gay poetry by people who saw themselves as primarily gay poets, and it was all about sex, very superficially. Mm. Um, masses of it, and it was all the same, but it was all about fantasies of having one boy after another, group sex and everything. I thought, is this all? <laughs> is this all gay poetry is? And I thought, this doesn't get anywhere really below the surface at all. Uh, so really that put me off a little. Um, I still think maybe it would be good to focus more on the actual feelings and relationships uh, of gay people um, because um, it's not spoken of enough and uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a poetry festival here in Nottingham where um, uh, Andrew McMillan uh, was reading and he does write well about the uh, male bodies and the interactions of men. There's also this guy Richard Scott. Um, who was shortlisted uh, for the um, prize, uh, the T.S. Eliot prize. I was read, he read a, a poem about um, his reaction to a statue in the museum, and I thought, this is really powerful, I like that, and I liked it. But when I saw it on page, he had about three words to a line, and it was, down, it was a script down the side of the page, over four pages, 
And I'd really like him to explain why he did that. Because it looks much less impressive on page when he reads it. But anyway, that's a bit of a digression. I'm sure he had a reason. Um, it'd be good to know. But yeah, I, I do think I should maybe focus my attention on thinking about the actual feelings uh, that I have experienced mm. and writing more from them. Can, can I just um, respond to that, that point you were making about those American gay poets of the 1970s? Uh, um, I just recently uh, read an anthology of some of that stuff reissued this year um, uh, from one of the gay American 1970s uh, mag magazines. Very sexually explicit, very celebratory, tremendous stuff, really good. And, and um, you know, I, I, yes, okay, there must be something other than sex, but I think that there's a huge amount of feeling in there as well, in, in that kind of loose limbed, celebratory, sexy, hippie ish, uh, um, uh, promiscuous. Uh, Spunk filled poetry <laughs> no, from the 70s that I really wouldn't want to um, just be too sniffy about. <laughs> I have to say, the first time that I um, wrote a sexually explicit poem, which wasn't about myself, it was about sort of imagined characters, there was a vague sense of pride at the end of it of going, Oh, I think that my, uh, my mother and friends would be quite horrified to read this. <laughs> and I think that there is quite a lot to be said with that shock value that you were kind of talking about before, but doing it in such a way that it's not just shocking for the sake of it, but it is still a commentary mm. about something else. And but it, it, go, going to what you're saying is, I'm kind of interested. Now, I mean, a bit of a digression, but I don't care at this point. <laughs> is it shock factor, or was it done with a purpose of making the message get more out in the open that this is what men are up to and people should? Well, they're, they're not writing for straight readers. They're, mm. they're writing for other gay readers. And, mm. and you know, um, so, so they're not writing to shock. Mm. They're, they're writing within a, a subculture that at the time, before AIDS, was using sex as politics and using politics as sex. And, and you know, gay liberation was very, very uh, um, much, um, from, from men's point of view, was very, very much uh, sex-based. and. Uh, kind of sex positive, mm. uh, cast off the shame uh, sort of mood and um, they didn't really give a toss what um, straight readers thought and they certainly weren't thinking of, of showing their poems to their mothers and, and <laughs> if their mothers read them well, neither so was I, I, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but I didn't dedicate it to it that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean that, that, that it, it was uh, and that generation of, of gay novelists as well, they, they, um, people like Edmund White, they, mm. they decided, I'm going to make a career as a writer, as a gay man, writing for other gay men. Let's mm. see if this is possible. I think it's the first generation that ever tried that. Mm. And it did turn out to be possible. And it also became clear that actually, if you wrote as a gay man for other gay men, if you wrote as a lesbian, for other lesbian women. Actually, there were all kinds of other readers who would be interested after all. Mm. Um, because, you know, we lead interesting lives. Mm. Even some of the most boring of us. <laughs> <laughs> but our lives are not just about sex, are they? No, but sex is one of the interesting things that goes oh, on. Of course. <laughs> but it occurred to me today that I've written very little about sex, gay sex, I mean, I, that my, Michelangelo one, I, I snuck in a reference to gay sex, but I'm kind of hiding behind that because it's not, not actually me in talk, speaking the poem. Mm. And yeah, it made me realise on one hand that I've not explored gay sex in my poems, but it also made me think, I've not explored lots of gay life and gay culture in my poems. Mm. Um, my husband, for example, is a sperm donor. Are there any poems about being a sperm donor? About being part of an extended family? I was going to say none that I've come across, but then I realised that was a terrible <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm ever so sorry. It's too late now. I've got to live with that. That's with me. <laughs> yeah, sorry to my family. Um, no, but, but I suppose, ultimately, as, as a poet, you can talk about anything, and you don't have mm. to 
pigeonhole yourself into like I am a queer poet therefore I can only mm. talk about queer matter you know one of the most recent poems that I've written about was about Brexit unfortunately I didn't want and it's mm. called I didn't want to write a poem about Brexit because I didn't but it's happened now <laughs> it could be the same thing with um you know a lot of queer artists at the end of the day you're a poet you're gonna write about what comes to you at the time mm. and that's it really and whether that is your to do with your sexuality or your community or whether it's just something that you've observed, but it, I guess it's more what I'm interested in about when people make the conscious decision of wanting to get to that audience that, you know, that would be out there. Because um, one of the other questions that I pose to all of you is that there's always that debate around the accessibility of meaning in poetry and readers having to work hard to solve poems. Um, and if you, as a queer poet, have ever used it to your advantage in any of your work, to hide a meaning, I mean, <laughs> I think it has been mentioned earlier in the conversation about you saying that you snuck something in there, mm. for example. Yeah, mm. maybe I'm still at the point where I'm, I'm not You're not explicit enough, Rich. <laughs> I need to be. Need to get but why do I need to be? Is it because I want to satisfy that queer audience out there? I don't know. Mm. Or am I not being true to myself? I don't know. Mm. And I had this dilemma when I brought these two poems, one which is more queer, one which is less queer. Mm. Uh, I kind of felt that I wanted to make a, po a point and read the less queer one, the mm. one's actually about my grandmother, mm. to make the point that queer poets don't always write queer poems. Absolutely. Yeah. Then again, maybe it is queer, I don't know, and I'm just blind to it. <laughs> maybe it's for other people to decide whether our poems are queer or not. Yes, I think it's the reader who determines, and uh, I think in, in my book, Articulate Flesh, uh, uh, I asked what, what is a gay poem, and it seems to me that a gay poem is a poem that l lends itself to the possibility of a gay reading. Mm. So it doesn't matter what the, the, doesn't matter whether the poet was gay or not, or, or whatever, that, that it's, the, it's in the reader's hands, and if the lesbian reader, or the gay reader, trans reader or something uh, uh, fights rather finds something in the poem that speaks to them mm. then it's that transaction that, that queers the poem uh, rather than uh, the biography of the, the writer mm. but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, bouncing your question back to you well um, there seems to be a sort of secret subtext there that, that <laughs> um, <laughs> about difficulty or obscurity and, and queer writing um, mm -hmm. that I couldn't quite unpick. I mean, are, are you suggesting that, that queerness should not be obscure or... I mean, I just, I, 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 I just wasn't quite clear where, where the question was coming from. I mean, what I'm always curious about is, um, because obviously as poets you like to play with meanings and fill things with riddles and kind of not quite say what you're trying to say. And what I just wondered if, if anyone had ever incorporated that into any of their work where, um, you know, it, but you've kind of already touched on it where a poem can be read as queer, but at the end of the day it's the reader who gives it the meaning. It's more me just being curious if you've ever injected that meaning there, hoping someone would find it, if that makes mm. sense. I've deliberately tried to write, or write poems which incorporate camp, camp humour, um, though I did find it was kind of lost on the audience I read it to. Completely. <laughs> 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 then that was a success. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, you win either way because if they don't, yeah. if they don't see it, then it means that you hid it really well, and yeah. if they do get it, it means they're really clever. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, it's a win-win. Yeah. I would yeah, argue. So. <laughs> but clarity can be quite difficult to achieve even when when you think you're achieving it. But if you've got a group of friends and you, they share poetry with each other, very often one of the big questions that comes up is, "Well, I didn't understand this bit, or what were you trying to get at?" And then um, if you don't, if you uh, present your poetry without having shown it to others, to other friends, you, you very often find that, oh, um, what was going on there? 
But of course, also, some, <coughs> when it comes to spoken word, um, mm. uh, you have to keep things pretty straightforward there. Uh, I mean, sometimes you, um, you have poems, if they're read carefully, the meaning is, is very, it's there. But if it's just read the first reading, I remember one time being at something down the box of grapes, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll read this sonnet I really quite like first. And everybody else before I got up was getting, and I read this one, silence. So I thought, it's okay, I'll read lighter stuff that's more straightforward <laughs> the, rest of the, the rest of the time. Um, because I, I knew that it was just, uh, it wasn't that it was obscure, it was just that you, you had to read it closely and think about it, which is not what is happening at a spoken word event generally, um, unless people get the chance to read it a couple of times. But I don't think I intentionally try to uh, be obscure. I'm not, I'm not terribly keen on uh, poetry that does try intentionally to be obscure. Uh, which, I mean, some uh, modern poets have been the opposite end of what I was talking about with those gay poets. I mean, I take what Greg was saying about there being a great effusion of sexual uh, liberation. And the 70s, I remember, them, were a very promiscuous decade because suddenly there was freedom. Uh, and it was very promiscuous in the poetry. What disappointed me about some of those poems was the, the, the narrow range of linguistic expression and the fact that it described a sexual encounter, and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, I much preferred the ones that went a bit further and said something a bit more about the people involved. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't try to be intentionally obscure because it's, it's so easy to lose the reader. And there is that comment that uh, I don't know who first made it. Uh, it. I don't think, I think it was deeply untrue, but it got great popularity when somebody said, most people ignore modern poetry because modern poetry ignores most people. Which I think is terribly true and a calumny. But you can see that the general public out there can get that idea. Well, you stopped me on that one. <laughs> that wasn't the intention. Sorry. Now I'm going to sit here wondering if everything that I'm writing is just alienating people. But it's. Um, I suppose, well, actually, you have to accept that as a writer, don't you, that whatever you are doing, regardless of whether it's poetry or fiction or memoir, you're, you're always going to alienate someone, I suppose, mm, yeah. aren't you? It's got kind of part of the game and it's part of the joy. No, was it alienating, <laughs> confusing. Um, mm. and, uh, some well, people are easily confused. Well, that, <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, I think being confused and feeling alienated can, can kind of go hand in hand, really, yeah. if you... Uh, for example, there's um, certain poets that you can read where it's almost like they're having a private conversation with themselves that you will never be able to unpick, but it's beautiful and it reads really nice and very lyrical, but you don't understand it, so you're not quite sure why you love it as much as you do. Um, but there is an argument that, that poetry is not meant to be understood anyway. I mean, uh, that's why it's not prose. Um, you know, prose is prosaic. Uh, po poetry is... is creating uh, landscapes of sound, it's, it, 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 it's creating a, a mystery, if you like, mm. uh, um, and with those um, aspects, it's, it, it's raising questions rather than answers. I mean, the, the, uh, did you use the word solving poems in, in, what, in your <laughs> I, question? I did put it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that seems to me a terrible thing, that, that, that perhaps kids are taught in schools as well, that you, you go to a poem and solve the right meaning. Well, this mm. seems to me to be an, a, a great obscenity. Mm. The, 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 um, you know, I've, uh, my favourite poets, the poets I read over and over again, are poets I've never understood. <laughs> um, you know, why, why would I go on rereading T.S. Eliot if I understood it? Um, this doesn't seem to me to be the point at all. So the, 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 it's a question that keeps coming up in, in discussions about poetry rather than just, just queer poetry, the, 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 this thing about accessibility. Well, you know, if you're writing and you have to be accessible, how, just how low do we have to set the bar? <laughs> I mean, I'm mean, serious. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you think about public debates about Brexit, <laughs> and you, you look at um, Vox Pops in the street where they're asking them about um, uh, how they're going to vote and, and so on. 
the level of human stupidity cannot really be plumbed. And so, you know, there's, there's no reason why a writer should aim that low. Mm. Um, but mm. you have to write at your own, at the level that you're comfortable with. Mm. Um, and also to read at the level that you're comfortable with. But, but that doesn't mean that you, you can only read things that you're going to understand. I mean, mm. it, some of the greatest sort of literature. Well, it's like, you know, if you listen to great music, or any music, are you supposed to understand it? No, of course not. Yeah. It's music. I mean, I've been, I've been listening to a band from Iceland all week, and I don't speak Icelandic, so... Well, no, no. <laughs> but, but even without the question of lyrics, mm. um, you know, you're not listening to music in order to understand it. And I don't see, um, you know, poetry, obviously, there's words there, and words mm. have meanings, but... but um, there's also music there, and that there, there are just these kinds of suggestions in the words, and, and um, uh, the, the way that the words play off each other and play off um, aspects of your memory, and just uh, the way they exist as pure sound and so on. As a poet, you're manipulating that, and you don't know how it's going to be received by mm -hmm. the reader at all. A wonderful uh, queer writer who's um, currently studying in America was a friend of mine as a teenager, um, Paul McQuaid once sent me a piece of work to critique and um, as I was reading it I said, oh it's great but I don't understand it and he just responded, good. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah which um, <laughs> I think says, says all that it needs yeah. to really. Um, so I'm just conscious of the time, so uh, what I will do is I'll, I'll ask my very obvious question to finish with. If a LGBTQ person was just getting into poetry, what advice would you have for them? So the reading of it or the writing of it? Either or. However you wish to interpret it. Other than run, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't give in to this, it'll um, consume you. <laughs> Maybe give them a reading list. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your uh, suggested reads off the top of your head if you can think of any? Uh, As I put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Tom Gunn. Mm -hmm. Whitman, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Michelangelo Sonnets, um, and uh, quite a few others, and maybe um, uh, um, Andrew McMillan as well, um, and, uh, and Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of us here. <laughs> I would also say don't accept any reading list. Do the work yourself. <laughs> find the poems that suit you. Excellent, a bit of contradiction. Oh, yeah. yeah I'll say, if you take my reading list, if you don't like it, tear it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, you, you can hear reams and reams of suggestions, can't you? But at the end of the day, if you're not going to, if it doesn't resonate with you, you're going to have to find your own. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I've ploughed through loads of mm. queer poets who I did not like and I felt were doing things which didn't resonate with me at all. Mm. Thankfully, there are <coughs> some which do, yeah. but it took a long while to find them, and it took work. Mm. So that's probably my advice. Don't think it's easy. Do some work. Do some research. Yeah. And I'd say also work on being a good poet before thinking about being a queer poet. Mm. Being a good poet's far more important. Yeah. It's something that came up yesterday, actually. Um, during the workshop was about uh, people who do the networking before they've got the material. So it's always that thing of um, whatever you're doing with poetry, make sure it's the poetry first before yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything afterwards, isn't and, it? And find out, talking about reading lists, find out who are your forebears, who is your, what lineage you mm. belong to. I know this is kind of a traditionalist kind of stance to promote and maybe lots of spoken word poets would reject this. Maybe, I don't know, that's a controversial point, but I don't know, I'll continue that because I do think that <laughs> lots of spoken word poets are not aware of traditions which they should learn from. Well, sometimes a lot of spoken word poets only listen and read other spoken word poets and mm. because it's something that they're just getting into now. And I would never begrudge that because it's no, not no, their no. passion and their inspiration, but yeah, there is a... 
a certain amount where you just think, well, there's this massive literary heritage that yeah. even if you yeah. go back and read it and go, I absolutely hated all of it, at least you, yes. <laughs> at least you yeah. try to absorb yeah. work it. Out what your relationship yeah. to it is. No, I, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. And I'd also say, on the back of book, work out, work out what kind of poet you are. Are you interested in being a page poet or a spoken word poet? Because obviously there's that the skill set needed for both. There's a massive overlap, mm. but there are major differences, I think. And it's, it would be good to work out what you want to be. And even if you want, do decide to be a spoken word poet, there is a tradition. You need to do the work and find out who's gone before you. I think I've probably I've got to sound like a teacher, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it for 22 teacher. years, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd probably sort of echo that to some extent. I'd say don't try and force yourself to be something you're not. Don't, I mean, don't try and write queer poetry just for the sake of writing poetry. Mm. Because you're queer, you must write queer poetry write the sort of poetry that you have to write rather than the sort of poetry that you think you ought to write. I think that's what I'd say. Yeah. I think um, my one piece of advice would be have an affair with a person whose language you don't speak and who doesn't speak your language. (laughs) And on that note... (laughs) (laughs) That wonderful final thought. Um, <laughs> I'll go and find that person. No, um, thank you so much for all of your uh, engaging contributions. It's been really interesting to hear all of your perspectives. Um, I'll just like to thank you all again by name for the purposes of the video recording. Thank you again for the Hennessy. Tony Callis. Rich Goodson. Ha <laughs> ha